Hi, this is Trent England with Save Our States with another one of our Six Questions podcasts. I'm really glad to welcome Josh Hammer, who is the opinion editor at Newsweek and a syndicated columnist, to talk with us for a few minutes and answer our six questions. Uh, Josh, thanks for being here. Anytime, Trent. Thanks for having me. So the, the first question goes to something that you, you write a lot about, which is big tech censorship uh, and what's going on out there in the, the, the intersection of the media and the internet. Uh, tell us what, what do you think is really going on when it comes to, uh, when it comes to big tech censorship of conservative viewpoints? So it's a fabulous question because it kind of makes, I think, a lot of conservatives kind of rethink some of their priors and try to like reapply some old principles to new existing paradigms. I, big tech is really kind of the tip of the spear of the 21st century issues on a domestic front. On the, on the foreign front, it's the Chinese Communist Party, but let's hold that aside for now. Big tech, what is actually happening here, I think, is you're seeing this new divide emerge. You know, I, look, I... I, I've been a conservative basically since I was in middle school. I'm not kind of one of those people who like sobered up at the age of 30 and, and woke up one day. So I, I, I've read all my Friedman, my Reagan, things of that nature. And, you know, Ronald Reagan in the 1980s famously, you know, it was, it was this famous line, the nine most terrifying words in the, in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help. But big tech is kind of the tip of the spear in revealing, I think, to a lot of people on the right that the new divide is not so much between the government and the private sector per se, as is between this kind of unibrow, uniparty, monolithic ruling class, to borrow the phraseology of the late great Angelo Codevilla, and kind of like the subjugated deplorables all across America. And big tech is kind of the de facto private sector appendage of choice, from my perspective, that the ruling class uses to silence dissenting viewpoints, to enforce its orthodoxy, to kind of keep a very narrow bandwidth of gatekeeping. So tangibly, the way that plays out, of course, I mean, the, the most ridiculous data point of them all, from my perspective, over the past few years, is what happened to the Hunter Biden laptop story from the, the New York Post, where I write very, very frequently. Uh, it, it's the nation's fourth largest newspaper by circulation, literally founded by Alexander Hamilton in like 1804, 1805, right around there. They were locked out of their own Twitter account for like two and a half weeks, less than a month before a monumental presidential election. Uh, you know, the, the FEC ultimately found that was not kind of a de facto campaign contribution to the Biden campaign, but to a lot of us, that's exactly what it looked like here. So they're clearly tipping the scales. And, you know, look, I mean, I, I, from, I, I've, I've been a vociferous pr proponent of conservatives getting a little more comfortable wielding state power if need be to rein in what, what seemed to me to be kind of pretty unaccountable oligarchs. So I, I'm trying to get conservatives to rethink a little bit. It's kind of public sector versus private sector, very simple paradigm, the former bad, the latter good. I think in the 21st century, it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah, that, that seems to be, uh, a lot of people seem to be realizing, I think that, uh, you know, some of the reasons why we are concerned about big government also apply to some of these entities, you know, once they scale to a certain point. Josh, you're involved in what's called national conservatism. There's a national conservative uh, conservatism conference coming up. Um, you're you're going to be there. You're a part of it. What is what does that mean? What what is national conservatism as contrasted from just sort of ordinary conservatism or what you you and I certainly have grown up with? So I, I am a research fellow at the Edmund Burke Foundation, which is the you know small think tank where uh, Yoram Hazoni is a chairman, uh, David Bragg is president, Kristen Muth, um, formerly of AEI, now at Hudson, is, is kind of the chair of the National Conservatism Conference. So uh, funny enough, friend, I'm actually speaking on a on a panel where the panel, the, the, the title of the panel is What is National Conservatism? So I'll, I'll have a better answer for you <laughs> a few weeks from now after I kind of produce this speech. It should be a great panel. It's me, um, Rachel Bovard, who's a dear friend, uh, Ryan Williams, president of Claremont Institute, and Julius Crime, the editor of American Affairs Journal. So great panel, great conference in general. Yoram and the whole crew did a fantastic job organizing this. I think kind of the initial kind of rallying cry that kind of got Edmund Burke Foundation started and this whole kind of labeling of national conservatism going forward, of course, was Yoram's 2018 book, The Virtue of Nationalism. And Yoram has, who's a dear friend and a mentor in many ways of mine, um, has been saying a lot of this, he's been writing a lot of this for decades. But I think kind of the, the galvanizing point for him, the impetus to kind of write this book, of course, was 
the Trump presidency in 2016, which, you know, as you and I both know, and all of our you know, fellow travelers know, really did kind of upend a lot of pre-existing orthodoxies, and I think make conservatives rethink a lot of things in general here. So from my perspective, at least, and I, I kind of like some of the themes have kind of trickled in through a lot of my writings that touch on this subject over the past couple of years, I guess I would personally argue that the like kind of capital C conservative capital M movement over the past 30, 40, 50 years, kind of looking back on it, I, I, at a pure consequentials level, I sometimes question just how much we've been able to win. We, th there are certain things I can concretely point to and say that we are winning. So like gun rights, for, for instance, that's one, that's one policy measure that I actually think like the right has overall done a great job of winning on. We need some more help from the court, but hold that aside. It's kind of a policy bread and butter state legislature issue. I think we're winning on that issue. But on a lot of other issues, it's frankly less clear to that. And one reason for that, from my perspective, and I, I probably need to eventually write a whole book on this, to be honest with you. But one reason for this is I think that the conservative movement has been probably overly influenced by kind of modern libertarian thought, a lot of kind of strands of libertarian kind of over individualistic thought. And there really is kind of a, a, a competing conservative strand of thought here that is a little more communitarian. Uh, we obviously don't like the word collectivism, but like a little more communitarian and kind of that Berkey and little platoon sense. Tocqueville, of course, when he was writing Democracy in America, spoke famously, of course, of these kind of uh, these, these, these bastions of communitarianism, whether it's the church, the family, and so forth. And ultimately, of course, <clears throat> these tribes, these little platoons, what, what, what they manifest into in a slightly broader scale is the nation state. And, you know, when Trump kind of got up there and he spoke about America first and all of that, he was, he, he really was kind of injecting this sense of, of, of nationhood, of peoplehood, of concrete peoplehood, because a lot of, you know, a, a lot of people, look, I, I love the Declaration of Independence. I born Abraham Lincoln's birthday. I love the Declaration. But some people kind of take this rhetoric to its logical conclusion and kind of notions of kind of universality and um, uh, universal principles. But, you know, John Quincy Adams, back when he was Secretary of State in 1821, just very quickly transitioned to foreign policy, of course, famously spoke about how we can wish these truths to apply to everyone, but we will be the vindicator only of our own. It's kind of like this, this reassessment that global, globalization on a, on a broader scale and individualism as a matter of kind of domestic political prioritization are kind of missing the picture on both ends. And we need to kind of recover a sense of community and nation. So a little complicated, I guess, and a little bit of a word vomit, but that's kind of what we're going for. No, it, it, that connects with me in, in a, lot of, a lot of different ways. I, I've become fascinated recently with the, the way that the so-called enlightenment has changed uh, a, a lot of people's understanding of, of Christianity and, and you know maybe even religion in general. And I think it seems like within conservatism, there's almost that same divide where there's sort of a, uh, a, a modern sort of ultra rationalist libertarianism that sees everything as being reducible. Uh, that's that, you know, as you say, has been sort of dominant without people without ever having a debate. And now we're having the debate, which I think is, uh, is, is really important uh, for our, our country and our movement. Uh, so uh, you're in the media Josh, is there a way to rebuild trust in the media? It's easy to look back to a golden age in the 20th century when, you know, people sort of were, you know, people could gather around the radio and listen to voices that everybody trusted. Uh, you know, is, is, is there a way to get back to anything like that? And if not, what what do you see in in uh, you know in the future of American media? The short answer is I'm not sure we're ever going to get back to that kind of proverbial day and age. But the one thing that I will say is because I thought a lot about this question myself actually. The one thing that, that I will say is I, like you, Trent. I kind of think back a lot of times to kind of uh, obviously you and I are both not necessarily fans of, of FDR, but I think back to like kind of those iconic FDR fireside chats, right, where the whole family was kind of gathered around. The radio listening listening to one kind of um, quote unquote trusted source here, and I think that that imagery is definitely powerful. But the one thing that I'll say that slightly contrasts with that, which I've also thought a lot about over the past few years, so I've kind of gotten deeper into the media world, is let's go back to like the, the election of eighteen hundred, of course, right? J John Adams versus Thomas Jefferson. The amount of invective and pejoratives, and frankly, just kind of 
ad hominem slurs that were thrown in the direction of each candidate and by extension, each political party, you know, that was the Democratic Republican Party for Jefferson, the Federalist Party for, for Hamilton, was really kind of off the charts. I mean, to, 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 to read some of this rhetoric, even from like a 21st century lens, is like, wow, they were like really publishing this. And like back then, the newspapers oftentimes weren't even necessarily kind of, they weren't even really hiding their bias. Like you kind of knew if you were picking up this tabloid, this broadsheet, whatever, that it would be aligned with this political party. They wouldn't literally say it, but everyone effectively knew that. And, you know, one thing that I used to work at the Daily Wire as an editor and a writer, and one thing that Ben Shapiro would often say there, and I, I think he's totally right about this, is Ben has often said that, you know, what is the point of like the New York Times, like the whole this idea editorial page, like what is the point of like the New York Times or CNN reporter on page one of the Times or the front page of CNN.com purporting to be quote unquote neutral on all the questions that fundamentally divide us? Like, there really is no point. I mean, it kind of makes a lot more sense actually in the, in, in the, in the interest of intellectual honesty to kind of just take the mask off, right? Um, uh, Real quick kind of side note, actually, this kind of notion that journalists cannot ever be kind of truly, quote unquote, neutral in what they're reporting, I would analogize actually to kind of like the act of legal and interpretation and judging. I'm not sure that like a legal interpreter or judge can ever be, quote unquote, truly historicist neutral as well. I think all of these are kind of inherently moral enterprises and kind of like a Straussian or Satelian stance, but hold, hold all that aside here. So let's get back to the state of the media. My basic answer when I talk to conservatives about what we should do, which is obviously like a, a, a massive kind of full circle, 360 degree kind of uh, assault, it seems like a lot of times upon uh, against conservatives and what we stand for. It's really kind of a two front strategy here. I'm a big booster of conservative media. I think conservative media is effective. I think it's effective as kind of, a, a, of an organizing tool. I think it's effective as just a kind of a means of of dissemination and frankly there's just like a lot of talent there and uh, obviously you know i used to work in conservative media for the daily wire so i have a somewhat of a personal interest here but you know i could I just go like publication by publication i mean there's there's some great stuff out there i mean my daily rotation of of websites of journals of, of hard copy on my on, on my desk of what i read is dominated by a lot of like um you know anywhere from kind of mid-brow to high-brow right of center thought right and uh, first thing city journals claremont review of books there's just so many right um so I, I strongly encourage everyone to kind of, you know, get involved with conservative media, whether that just means as a consumer or if you're so inclined as a, as a possible writer. But the other part of the two prong strategy, which is what I'm currently doing, is to try to find some ways to make inroads in kind of mainstream existing institutions here. I mean, look, I've had a lot of conversations over the, the past year and a half. I've, I've been in Newsweek for less than two years now, but people oftentimes look at me and you're like, did, did you say Newsweek or Newsmax? And I'm like, no, no, Newsweek, like, like the magazine that's been around since like the FDR fireside chats, like, like wow, like, how did you get a job there? And, um, you, you know, look, I, 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 it's public information, obviously, the majority owner, CEO of Newsweek, his name is, is public, Dev per God. So, I mean, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm there ultimately at his, um, with his blessing and, and my higher ups, I, I think are reasonably happy with, with how I'm doing there. But when opportunities do arise for conservatives to make inroads at existing institutions, I think that we should do it. And, um, you know, so speaking personally at the Newsweek uh, op-ed page that uh, I, I, I head up, we have three deputy editors, we're publishing full spectrum content. It's not exclusively conservative content. I have one fellow conservative who's a deputy and then two kind of center left deputies. They're, they're, they're anti-woke. They're not kind of like crazy people, but they're, but they're center left. But the value add, of course, is that every single day we're publishing conservative content and not exclusively kind of like, you know, generic, like controlled opposition style content either, oftentimes like pretty aggressively conservative content. So that really is the two pronged way that I see this going forward, like support conservative media, there's so much good stuff there. But when opportunities arise for people like me to kind of slip in there, we have to take advantage of that as well. Makes sense to me. I'm Trent Engel with Save Our States, talking with Josh Hammer, opinion editor of Newsweek and a syndicated columnist. So Josh, you know, Save Our States is focused on defending the Electoral College. You're a defender of the Electoral College as well. Um, tell us about how, how you see this, you know, why, why you see this debate as being important. I, I think a lot of people look at this and they say, look, popular vote Electoral College doesn't, doesn't really make much of a difference. Maybe the Electoral College is just some sort of antiquated institution. Um, what, what's your view? So to take us back to like real first principles here, of course, um, the Electoral College is 
and your audience is really the last one I need to explain this to, but 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 I might as well just say it anyway. The electoral college is one of like the many tools, or or, or it's really one of the many features, I should say, that the framers put in to our founding charter to kind of weave throughout it and basically kind of pronounce the people and ultimately then implement in, in structural concrete form that this was a document not of pure lowercase d democracy, but, but it was a document that would kind of channel the will of the people in a profoundly lowercase r Republican way, ultimately redounding to the common good of the whole, to the national interest, whatever you want to call it here, you know, to all the aims enunciated in the preamble, more perfect union, general welfare, and so forth. So look, obviously, you know, perhaps the most, the, perhaps the most famous Federalist paper of them all is obviously Federalist 10, right? James Madison famously talks about the problem of faction and how do you deal with, with the problem of faction um, in, a, in a, you know, uh, in a democracy, in a republic, and uh, how, how, you, how you weave in these counter-majoritarian instruments here. The, uh, to say an obvious point, the framers were obviously terrified of, of monarchical tyranny. They, they quite literally rebelled against kind of a, a, a monarch in King George III, who you, you can go back to the Declaration and read this long list of grievances. They thought they were, uh, the king was infringing on both their uh, English common law rights, according to the English Bill of Rights of 1689, and by extension, of course, their, their natural rights to, in the minds of a lot of framers as well here. But on the other hand, they were also terrified of pure, unadulterated, majoritarian democracy. They did not want that. And they, they took such great pains to prevent that from happening. Obviously, they separated um, you know, constitutionally, both the, vertically, of course, you have the federal government and, and the 50 state governments. At the time, it was not 50, but you know, same thing. And then, of course, um, Article 1, Article 2, Section 3, you have the Congress, the presidency, and the judicial branch. And even within the Congress, obviously, there's kind of the, the uh, plebiscitary uh, measure uh, that is the House of Representatives, that is direct vote, the Senate, of course, which is not direct vote. So they obviously then there's a, the direct election of senators at 17th Amendment. There are so many tools in there to prevent this thing from becoming a runaway democracy. And at a very concrete level, what the Electoral College does, of course, is it makes sure that a lot of people have a concrete vote in who the president is who wouldn't otherwise have a vote. If you got rid of the Electoral College here, if we, especially in the year 2021, this, this is true back in the late 18th century as well, I think. But especially in the year 2021, if you got the Electoral College, what is the exactly is the incentive for a presidential and a vice presidential contender to campaign anywhere outside of New York, LA, maybe here in South Florida, where I live, and like a, and, and, a, and a select few other locations, right? There really is no incentive here. So if we want to ensure that the American people at large actually have a say in who is the leader of the country and who is the leader of the free world. And if we want to obviously preserve this wonderful foundation in counter-majoritarian republicanism, lowercase r republicanism, that is. Um, and, you know, I, I, I get really encourage the, the viewers to go back and reread Madison Federal's 10. He lays this out much more clearly than I ever could hope to. If we want to preserve all of that. Then you, you, you have to fight for the Electoral College. I mean, it, it, it is probably the preeminent constitutional structural means to achieving those ends currently, I think. Makes sense to me, obviously. Uh, so, Josh, the, the two final questions are, uh, are a little bit quicker here. Um, question number five is, who is your favorite Supreme Court justice and why? Well, I think the answer has to be Clarence Thomas, right? Um, I mean, Clarence Thomas, I've only, I've tragically, I've only briefly met him. I, I would just love to get to spend more time with him. I, I've been so fortunate to run in various circles where he's hired so many of my friends as clerks over the years. So I, I have to hope that that will happen at some point here. So by, by all accounts, he's, first of all, before getting the jurisprudence, just like a truly wonderful man. Um, like every time I, I watch him speak and I hear like his like very like hearty laugh, um, I, you, you, can't help, you can't help but laugh along with him. He has this just, just this remarkable, inspiring story growing up dirt poor in the Jim Crow South, um, didn't even speak English as his first language growing up there. And, um, you know, he made it all the way to the top, obviously. There's a wonderful documentary film that came out about a year and a half ago from a former Claremont State President, Michael Pack, was the director of that film. Um, it just it's such a wonderfully inspiring man. He literally like drives a bus and RV across America, goes to NASCAR games, just like a true, like all, like all American guy. But jurisprudentially here, 
you know, Justice Thomas is probably the, he is the stalwart. I mean, for everyone on the right of center, he has been leading the way, even when Justice Scalia was, was on the court and Justice Scalia obviously was a, was a fabulous justice in so many ways. But even when they were on the court together, it was usually Justice Thomas who was staking out what I would argue was a more principled position, probably even, you know, to, to Justice Scalia's right in some cases where they, where they disagreed with one another. I think Justice, Justice Thomas more so than Justice Scalia has a, really deep rooted understanding of kind of the substantive orientation of the American constitutional order um, oriented towards kind of the aims of the declaration of, 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 the, of, the, of the preamble, um, natural law, like whatever, whatever phraseology you want to call it. I think he understands that in, in a way that Justice Scalia didn't necessarily at least allow himself to understand. I think he kind of willfully kind of, he was, he, he was smart enough to understand it obviously, but he didn't allow his jurisprudence to go there. So Justice Thomas really is kind of just the stalwart. Um, he's just a man of just profound principle. Um, on the current court, I'll give a brief shout out as well just to Justice Alito, who I think is just a fabulous justice. Um, there are actually various cases where I think Justice Alito has been right, where Justice Thomas ha has been wrong. There are a couple of like eight to one free speech opinions where Justice Alito is kind of like the sole dissenter. Um, there's a case called Snyder versus Phelps, one called U.S. versus Stevens. Um, so Justice Alito is a fabulous justice. He actually is arguably even closer to me as far as my current like new pet project that I call Common Good Originalism. I think Justice Alito might be more of a quote unquote common good originalist as I'm ex explicating the, the term and what I mean by that. But really to answer your question, Justice Thomas is still kind of the North Star. He is the true North, I think, for everyone on the right of center, whether you're kind of a first year law student joining the Federal Society to a you know, 50, 60 year old legal conservative lawyer practicing at the highest level, you still look to Justice Thomas for, for guidance, really. Okay, Josh, final question. Who is your favorite American founder? And of course, why? This is, a, so I love, I, I, I love this question. I mean, it's hard, obviously, to, to name only one. Um, look, you know, as I've kind of gone deeper into national conservatism over the past few years, I think a lot of people in, in, in these kind of NatCon circles increasingly look to Alexander Hamilton. And I've reread a lot of Hamilton. My answer to this question, honestly, probably would have been different like five or six years ago than it is now. I, I think five or six years ago, I would have kind of given like a very kind of standard kind of boilerplate, probably, you know, probably James Madison, um, you know, uh, maybe like uh, Randolph, uh, I, you know, maybe if I was feeling a little fiery one day, George Mason, but um, <laughs> I, 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 I probably would answer the question without, with, with Alexander Hamilton now. I, John Marshall, arguably, I mean, he was a little younger during like the true founding days, but I love John Marshall. Well. But just sticking with, ha with Hamilton for a second here, first of all, speaking of like personal biographies, I mean, Hamilton's story obviously is itself incredible, right? I mean, an orphan um, born, born in the Caribbean, you know, speaking of kind of um, rising to prominent uh, preeminence, really. The, Hamilton, Hamilton actually wrote the bulk of the Federalist Papers, you know, um, it, yep. it, Madison and Federalist 10, Madison 45, Madison 51, a lot of Madison's papers kind of stand out in kind of the American lexicon uh, as being these iconic papers, rightfully so. But, uh, and John Jay wrote the first handful. Um, he has some fabulous ones as well. But Hamilton actually wrote the overwhelming majority of them. It's, our, it, it's possible that no one did more with it, with, with the exception probably of George Washington himself to actually found America than this man who was born in the Caribbean, uh, you know, as an orphan to immigrants, just this, just this incredible story, obviously tragically died. Well, you know, like in his prime in, 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 in that famous duel there. But I, I, I think on this kind of, in, in these kind of national insurgents and circles, we're seeing kind of a resurgence of Hamiltonian thought in a lot of realms here. There's, you know, obviously, you can you can look at uh, what Orrin Cass is doing with American Compass. I mentioned Julius Crime, what he's doing with American Affairs Journal, and especially kind of just like concretely looking at the landscape. What happened during the early onset of COVID with respect to China hoarding uh, PPE and us not even having masks? A lot of people are asking like basic like supply chain issues here, and we're really starting to I think question you know uh, the so-called neoliberal opening with china in particular right over the past 50 years i mean how much has quote unquote free trade with china actually been a good thing well i would argue it is it, 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 that it has not been a good thing and you know if there's one person who in retrospect really kind of saw this coming you can go back to hamilton 1791 report on manufacturers kind of talking about the need to build kind of like a strong industrial base here and you know as i, as I kind of survey the landscape and look at 
how quote unquote free trade with China, which inherently is not particularly free trade, um, how, how that is kind of torn asunder the American heartland and all the opioid deaths across Ohio, Michigan, whatever. It, it just seems to me that Hamilton was really onto something there. And also just real quick on kind of like a jurisprudential note as well here, Hamilton, perhaps even more so than, than Madison was really emphatic um, about two things. He was really emphatic about, on the one hand, this notion that, you know, as um, as how the archivist likes to point all the time, that there are these quote unquote anchoring truths. Hamilton wrote about this in Federalist 31, that, that there are these notions, th these everlasting principles in order to derive constitutional cases, you have to start from these first principles and then get lower to derive what the actual concrete facts of the case are. Hamilton spoke about this at great length, um, probably even more persuasively than Madison or, or probably any other founding father. So he, and I, you know, I, I, of course, wholly believe that that kind of imbues a lot of my legal writing. So I take a lot of inspiration from that as well. And the other thing is that, you know, look, uh, uh, what Madison said in Federalist 45 about how the federal government's powers are um, few and defined, that's Article 1, Section 8, of course, and the state's powers are numerous and definite. That's totally right, of course. The 14th Amendment changes that a little bit, but that's still basically totally right. On the other hand, the pushback that that Hamilton, the Federalist Party gave, and I think he was correct to do this, was they basically said, well, look what happened to the Articles of Confederation. We took that way too far in the other direction here. So at the same time, like we want the states to be very powerful, but we need the national government to be secure in its own ability as well here. And that kind of played out in concrete form, of course, in kind of the early era republic debate over the constitutionality of the national bank. That kind of culminated of in, in the McCullough versus Maryland decision of 1819, where Chief Justice Marshall says the bank is constitutional. So Hamilton was actually vindicated on that after uh, after he passed away, of course. So um, I'm kind of rambling at this point, but uh, Hamilton, I, I, if I had to pinpoint one, is probably my favorite founder at this point. Sounds good to me. Josh Hammer, uh, opinion editor at Newsweek and syndicated columnist. Thanks so much for joining us on another Six Questions podcast. I'm Trent England for Save Our States. Thanks for watching.